I will invite um, His Excellency Winston Setown uh, to give his address. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to give you, oh, this is the Myanmar, this section is particularly about Myanmar and Japan relationship, but I'm going to give you a flavor of the banking and financial policies in a country since I'm the vice governor of the central bank. And I'm going to give uh, a bit of flavor of the Tilawa Special Economic Zone in the country since I'm the head of the Tilawa Special Economic Zone. Then I'm going to conclude the sections, not, not this section, I'm going to conclude my presentations. The first of all, when we talk about financial and banking policies, they are becoming trickier and also more sophisticated these days, as we are currently in an environment where there are transnational financial and economic impacts. And unfortunately, these transnational or cross-border financial and economic impacts tend to be quite contagious recently, especially because of the economic integration and things like that. As everybody is aware that Myanmar has been asleep and isolated for many years, especially not really many years, many decades in the past. And we just suddenly woke up in the middle of the global crisis, in the middle of the global actually crises. And many other countries in the region uh, that have been open up for quite some time, like for example, in the case of Vietnam, it has been open up since Dwayne in 1986. And these countries have been bracing for these kind of international impacts. And some countries have been steering their economies through the monetary and fiscal policies to mitigate these international impacts coming, affecting their countries. But in the case of Myanmar, we are just at the stage of building, building up all the necessary financial infrastructures and necessary financial instruments in a country. So it means that while other countries are actually driving a Mercedes Benz on a highway road, but we are sort of like in a situation where we have already paved the road, but the road is not yet asphalted. So it's a little sort of bumpy at this moment. We have already built a car, a very good car, but there is not yet steering and a gear. So it's quite difficult for the time being to go to the places where we want to go at a speed where we want to, uh, where we want to, at the speed which we want to have. So that's a kind of very simple kind of situations that we are having at this moment. As the Central Bank of Myanmar, we are responsible in three main areas. The first area is monetary policy. The second area is financial stability through the bank, bank, bank supervisions. And the third area is very important, uh, particularly to signify the relationship between Japan and Myanmar, that is the payment and settlement of all the financial institutions across the whole country. The monetary policy in a country, in a monetary policy area, is also very tricky these days. There are many countries, like in the United States, UK, U European Union, Japan, and many other countries, are fighting for inflation in order to get 2% target level of inflation. But many other countries are actually, like Myanmar, are fighting against inflation. And while the Fed in the U.S. has been thinking about planning to increase the rate probably in a couple of months' time, I'm not a fortune teller, I cannot really say that, what patience that Chairman Jalen just said just recently. But the thing is that there are also many other countries in the, globe, in, in the world that have been planning for the time being to cut the interest rate. So we are seeing trans-Atlantic interest rate diversion that is happening at this moment, at this very time. And there are many countries that have engaged into the monetary stimulus, we call it QEs or quantitative easings, to fight against a negative inflation because most of the people don't really want to call deflation. So most of the people want to call only like negative inflations or to sort of like, you know, to fight against lowflation in some other cases to boost up their sluggish economies. But there are also some other countries purposely enter into these kind of sort of monetary and fiscal stimulus. I don't want to name the name although they are having quite significant level of economic development, particularly in order to stay competitive in the currency world that is actually happening at this moment. But in Myanmar case, although our capital account is not yet open know, or liberalized completely, but we are not really isolated from all these impacts. All the necessary financial markets and necessary financial instruments and tools are being developed for the time being. And 
you know, as you know that we are not really isolated from the global as well as from local impacts. So our currency, as you know, uh, Kudosan also mentioned that our currency, uh, and also Vikran also mentioned that our, uh, we had experienced drastic uh, depreciation of the currency in the past three, four months. And it could have actually, such the level of currency depreciations could have triggered a level of quite significant level of inflation. But we are lucky because we have been doing a constant level of sterilizations in the country through you know, not only indirect but also direct channels of our monetary policy in order to make our monetary policy implementations to be much more transparent and also to be uh, transmissions to be much more effective. And at the same time, you know, we are also given a favor by the global economy. You know, the decline in the international food prices, decline in the energy prices, they are not really a good news for the countries like United States or UK or in, in the European country, you know, you know where you know, the, the higher inflation is really like needed, but it's really, it really helps a lot in order to uh, maintain the level of inflation about five to six percent per annum. So having a, a, in a country, having an economic growth of seven to eight percent, and having this level of inflation maintained at about five to six percent is not really bad at all. We are also going through the series of financial liberalizations in a country. Whenever we talk about liberalizations, we're talking about banking sector liberalization and capital account liberalization. As a result of, in, as in the process of banking sector liberalization, most of the people probably might, might be aware that we have selected nine foreign banks to open up their 100% branches in a country. So it's a part of like banking sector liberalization. Also, there are some conditionalities imposed in order not to have the domestic banks and financial institutions to be absolutely marginalized, but we are also in the process to relax all these conditions. And all these conditions we have imposed are very common type of conditions that you can find in many countries in the region. But capital account liberalization is a bit tricky. We are very cautious about it. Uh, not only Myanmar, but also all the countries in the ASEAN are very cautious at this moment about the capital account liberalizations. So in ASEAN, we've been always talking about AEC, that is ASEAN Economic Community. The uh, AEC has, you know, we are very much committed, all the ASEAN members are very much committed to the free flows in the AEC, like free flow of goods, free flow of uh, services, free flow of investment, free flow of laborers, and free freer, not completely free, freer flow of capital. Because all the members of the ASEANs are still very cautious about capital account liberalization at this moment because the necessary financial markets and financial instruments are not yet available in their country so that it's going to be very difficult to deal or to cope with a problem related to all these kind of hot money flows and inflows and outflows like tourist dollars coming into the country, coming in and out of the country. But we are also in the process of such liberalizations. We have already liberalized our current account, and we also uh, allow capital inflows and outflows not exceeding 10,000 US dollars per time. And we are also liberalizing the profit repatriations. For example, if you are doing a business in a country, if you want to remit your profit uh, back to your country in terms of profit repatriations, you don't really have to come to the central bank anymore. You just go to the, any private commercial banks and you have to show the documentary evidence that this is a profit after tax, and then without requiring any approval from the authorities from the central bank, you can do your profit repatriations uh, as soon as possible. We are also allowing offshore loans by the private sector as well. Of course, we are a bit cautious in this area because this is the particular problem that had driven Asian financial crisis in 1997. But at that time in Thailand, the private loans in terms of US dollars uh, you know, was really like 52% of the GDP. Uh, for the time being, the private loans, you know, private offshore loans in US dollars is still less than 1% of GDP, but we are really cautious, particularly in this area, although it is not really a, like a worrying stage at this moment. In the area of banking supervisions, we are, also, we are also developing a lot of instructions to the banks in order to make the banks to be much more compliant to international Basel requirements. And again, the payment and settlement system, which is another responsibility the central bank is taking. They, this is the, the very important area that signifies the relationship between the Japanese government. Because the Japanese government has provided us with a grant in order to have our central, uh, central bank to be modernized. Because in the payment and settlement area, in the whole entire history of the central bank for the past six decades, we have been using 
the, this payment and settlement system. We have been conducting this payment and settlement system for the whole financial institutions across the country manually. You can actually see how difficult it was and how tedious. But for the time being, we are aiming to have the fully automated real-time payment and settlement computerized systems to be functioning and live by the end of 2015. We're going to have the office automation system across the whole central bank and its branches uh, in the country. We are going to have the RTGS real-time uh, gross settlement system. Uh, we are going to have computerized general ledger system as uh, a core accounting system. We are also going to have mechanized check clearing systems that's going to be live and functioning by the end of 2015. That's going to be a significant time we are going to have. And also the Tilawa uh, special economic zone also is the, one of the, the very uh, important projects that is being developed with, between the Myanmar government, Japanese government, also the private sectors from the two countries. And that has been quite successful at this time because this is the very first special economic zones uh, having the totally different concept uh, that is adopted in Myanmar. Because Tilawa special economic zone is made to be special, not only Tilawa, but also any other special economic zone ever developed in the country are to be made special. But since Tilawa special economic zone is the first special economic zone, so we have to make a lot of precedences in order to make, in order to pave way for other special economic zones. Like for example, the policies, procedures that are to be adopted or that are being adopted in the Tilawa special economic zones are absolutely different from those policies and procedures that are being practiced outside of the zone, and then they are made to be absolutely in line with international standards and practices. To sum up, we are still struggling to maintain the stable macroeconomic climate in the middle of all these international crises and impacts. It is really frustrating, still frustrating, because we are, you know, we are still trying to you know, fix things domestically, but we cannot also you know, brace you know, effectively uh, for the international uh, transatlantic sort of like impacts coming into the country, but we are still very optimistic. So I often say to other people that we are always optimistically frustrated. <laughs> and one frustrating thing in the financial sector is that we cannot skip a single sequence. That is a problem. We have been trying, we have done a lot of brainstorming sections, how to leapfrog, to skip some of the sequences. In a financial sector, that is not the case. We have to go through sequence by sequence in order to reach the game. Like for example, we like to do open market operations like many other central banks in the world, but without having, without having secondary bonds market in a country, you can't actually do open market operations at all. These are a kind of frustrating sequences that we still have to follow. So I would like to conclude by saying a very small, uh, funny story. The, the story was quite popular among the young people, probably about five, six years ago. At that time, most of the people you know, were really frustrated because nobody hoped that nobody expected that Myanmar was going to become like this in the process of the democratization. The story was like this. There, was the, there were like the three heads of states from three countries. They are actually the head of state from the United States of America, and the head of state from China, and head of state from Myanmar, who just happened, fortunately, happened to meet with the almighty, the God. And the God actually allowed them to ask as one question each. And the first one, the head of state of the United States of America, asked one question. He asked, God, when would be the time that United States is going to be the most powerful country with its military power? Then the God replied, yes, it's going to happen, but not in your time. So he's not really happy about it. Then another, another one is the head of state coming from China, and he also asked a similar question. God, when would be the time that China is going to be the most you know, powerful country uh, in terms of our economic power? Then the God replied, yes, it's going to happen, but not in your time. So he's also not very happy about it. Then a person from Myanmar coming in and then he asks a totally different questions. He asks, God, when would be the time Myanmar is going to be a democratic country? The so God replied, he paused a little bit and after that he replied and saying that, Yes, of course, it's going to happen, but not in my time. 
So it was the joke, quite popular, about five, six years ago. At that time, we did not really have any ray of hope in the end of the tunnel because there was no tunnel at that time. But for the time being, we have the tunnel, and we have the bright ray of hope in, at the end of the tunnel. This is where we are going. We are still very committed with a strong political will to move always to continue move forward during the process of this democratization and to have this sustainable, inclusive and equitable economic development of the country. Thank you very much.